Let's do some past map questions. A 32 year old woman presents with a history of painful regular periods. This memory since stopping the combined oral contraceptive pill eight months ago. Her periods are more painful and heavy. She is upset because she would like to conceive, but the pain is limiting intercourse. So there's this peronia as well. She would like to know the cause of her symptoms. On examination, her abdomen is soft and non-tender with no masses, but a biomedical examination, pelvic examination is limited due to pain. So there's excitation pain. Probably there's pelvic inflammatory disease, PID. What is the gold standard diagnostic test for this woman? How do you diagnose PID? Is it actually PID though? Dysmenorrhea and uh, painful pelvic examination. How do you diagnose pelvic inflammatory disease? Laparoscopy, I think. You can see the adhesions in the uterus. See, yes, that's the correct answer. Laparoscopy is the gold standard investigation for patients with suspected endometriosis. Oh, it's endometriosis, it's not PID. It's painful regular periods since stopping the combined oral contraceptive pill eight months ago. Her periods are more painful and heavy. Hmm, how do you differentiate between PID and endometriosis in this kind of presentations? Hmm. Laparoscopy is the gold standard investigation for patients with suspected endometriosis. It allows direct visualization and biopsies of the endometrial deposits. A CT scan may be used to show endometrial deposits, but they are less specific than MRI scans. Ultrasound can be helpful to show endometrial mass, but a normal scan does not exclude endometriosis. CA125 is not used to diagnose endometriosis. A raised serum CA125 may be consistent with endometriosis, but a normal result is not excluded. Pelvic MRI scans should not be used as a primary investigation for endometriosis. They can be helpful before laparoscopy to assess the extent of deep endometriosis, but laparoscopy remains the gold standard investigation. Endometriosis, some notes, some brief notes about it. Endometriosis is a common condition characterized by growth of ectopic endometrial tissue outside the uterine cavity. Around 10% of women with a reproductive age have a degree of endometriosis. Clinical features include chronic pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, pain often starts days before bleeding, deep dyspareunia, subfertility, non-gynecological uh, features include urinary symptoms, dysuria, urgency, hematuria, dyskasia, painful bowel movements. Um, on pelvic examination, reduce organ mobility, tender nodularity in the posterior vaginal fornix, and visible vaginal endometriotic lesions may be seen. Investigation, laparoscopy is the gold standard investigation. There is little role for investigation in primary care, for example, ultrasound. If the symptoms are significant, the patient should be referred for definitive diagnosis. Management depends on clinical features. There is poor correlation between laparoscopic findings and severity of symptoms. NICE published guidelines in 2017. NSAIDs and or paracetamol are recommended first-line treatments for symptomatic relief. If analgesia does help, then hormonal treatments such as combined oral contraceptive pill or progestogens, for example, medoxyprogesterone, med med medroxyprogesterone acetate should be tried. If analgesia or hormonal treatment does not improve symptoms or if fertility is a priority, the patient should be referred for secondary care. Secondary treatments include GnRH analogs said to induce pseudomenopause due to the low estrogen levels. Uh, drug therapy unfortunately does not seem to have a significant impact on fertility rates. Drug therapy does not have a significant impact. Mm, surgery, some treatments such as laparoscopic excision and laser treatment of endometriotic ovarian cysts may improve fertility. Let's look at the osmosis video on endometriosis. Oh, zero for finals video seems to have more outputs. Look at both of them then. Learning medicine is hard work. Osmosis makes it easy. Been tried free today. Endo means internal and metrium means womb. So endometrium is the innermost layer of the womb, and endometriosis is where these endometrial cells grow outside of the womb. The female internal sex organs are the ovaries, which are the female gonads, the fallopian tubes, two muscular tubes that connect the ovaries to the uterus, which is a strong muscular sac that a fetus can develop in. It's a hollow organ that sits behind the urinary bladder and in front of the rectum. The top of the uterus, above the openings of the fallopian tubes, is called the fundus, and the region below the openings is called the uterine body. 
The uterus tapers down into the uterine isthmus and finally the cervix, which protrudes into the vagina. It's anchored to the sacrum by uterosacral ligaments, to the anterior body wall by round ligaments, and it's supported laterally by cardinal ligaments, as well as a mesometrium, which is a part of the broad ligament. The wall of the uterus has three layers, the parametrium, which is a layer continuous with the lining of the peritoneal cavity, the myometrium, which is made of smooth muscle that contracts during childbirth to help push the baby out, and the endometrium, a mucosal layer that undergoes monthly cyclic changes. In endometriosis, the cells that make up the endometrium migrate and implant themselves in other parts of the body. Once there, they'll set up camp and start growing to form a mass of endometrial tissue. Most often, this affects the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and uterine ligaments. But it can also affect other structures in the pelvis and abdomen, like the parametrium, the rectovaginal septum, the rectouterine pouch, also called the pouch of Douglas, and even the intestines or bladder. Although we're unsure of the exact cause of the endometrial cell migration, there are at least five main theories that try to explain this phenomenon. First, retrograde menstruation theory says that during menstruation, some blood carrying endometrial cells will flow backwards into the fallopian tubes and implant into nearby tissue. Sometimes there can also be a patented fallopian tube, meaning there's an opening in it, so the adventurous endometrial cells could actually escape and travel to the other pelvic and abdominal structures. Now, because retrograde flow is much more common than endometriosis, other factors probably come into play. So the second theory is that there's a dysfunction with the immune system where B and T cells don't respond to endometrial implants and allow it to grow. Third, the metaplastic theory suggests that the cells of the peritoneum, which come from the same cell line as endometrial cells, can transform spontaneously into endometrial tissue. This theory explains how in rare cases, a woman that underwent a hysterectomy, where the uterus was surgically removed, can still develop endometriosis. The fourth and fifth theories are especially useful for explaining how endometrial implants show up in places like the lungs or heart. Benign metastases theory says that endometrial cells can travel to distant organs through the lymph and blood, while extrauterine stem cell theory says that the stem cells in the bone marrow differentiate into endometrial cells and then travel to other parts of the body. In addition to these proposed causes, there are some risk factors for developing endometriosis. These include a family history of endometriosis, never having been pregnant, early menarche, and late menopause. Now, whatever the cause, endometriosis implants are benign, so they don't grow out of control like cancerous cells. However, because they're functionally the same as the epithelial cells found within the uterus, they have the same estrogen receptor, so they go through the same proliferation, secretion, and menstruation cycle, just like the normal endometrial cells. But there are two key differences between normal endometrial cells and endometriosis implants. First, the implanted cells contain high levels of the enzyme aromatase, which allows them to produce their own estrogen. Second, the implanted cells release pro-inflammatory factors, which causes inflammation and scarring. These scars could cause adhesions, which is a binding of different organs or structures to each other, affecting their normal anatomical placement. Both the pro-inflammatory factors and estrogen also promote the growth of new blood vessels, which nourish the implant. Now, changes in hormone levels and chronic inflammation will cause the implant to bleed, especially during menstruation. If the implant is on an ovary, it can form an endometriomas, or chocolate cysts, which contain the old dark blood and shed tissue. When these get too large, they'll rupture and spill their contents, resulting in a lot of pain and even more inflammation. Endometrioma cells also tend to develop mutations in certain genes, including PTEN and arid one a which increase the risk of developing ovarian carcinomas. The symptoms of endometriosis can be quite debilitating and are related to the location of the endometrial cells. Most commonly, endometriosis on the reproductive organs will cause pelvic pain, bleeding, dysmenorrhea, or painful menstruation, and dyspareunia, or painful sexual intercourse. If it involves the pouch of Douglas, a section of the peritoneum located between the rear wall of the uterus and the rectum, it can cause dyskesia, or pain with defecation. It can also cause urgent, frequent, and sometimes painful urination if it involves the bladder, and abdominal pain if it involves the intestines. All these symptoms will often vary with the hormone changes throughout the menstrual cycle, and often gets worse during menstrual periods. About 30 to 40% of women with endometriosis are subfertile. The exact link between infertility and endometriosis isn't totally clear. It's believed that the inflammation that comes with endometriosis can damage or scar the reproductive structures, thus inhibiting the release of the egg or its movement through the fallopian tube. Damage to the uterus can also make the implantation of the gamete more difficult. The good news is that pregnancy is often still possible, depending on the severity of the endometriosis and the effectiveness of the treatment. The best way to diagnose endometriosis is through laparoscopy, and the diagnosis can be confirmed with a biopsy. Treatment is focused on managing pain, trying to limit the progression of the implants, and addressing the associated subfertility. Common hormonal medications that are used to treat pain include combined estrogen progesterone oral contraceptive pills, which relieve pain through ovarian suppression, progesterone analogs like medroxyprogesterone and levonorgestrel, which inhibit growth of the endometrium, danazol, which is a steroid that inhibits mid-cycle surges of follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, and prevents steroidogenesis in the corpus luteum, and gonadotropin-releasing hormone modulators, which cause a decrease in estrogen levels. Surgical options are available for severe cases. If the woman still wants to have children, the surgery involves only excision of endometrial implants, endometriomas, and adhesions. If she has completed her childbearing, or if the pain is too debilitating, a hysterectomy and oophorectomy with excision of any other endometrial implants is done. Whatever the treatment, once menopause hits and hormone levels fall, the symptoms generally go away. All right, as a quick recap, endometriosis is when cells of the endometrium grow outside the uterus. These cells follow the same hormonal cycle as normal endometrial tissue, including secretion and bleeding. This causes inflammation, scarring, adhesions, and endometriomas. Common symptoms include pelvic pain and bleeding that gets worse during menstruation, and infertility. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, take a look at osmosis.org, where we have flashcards, questions, and other awesome tools to help you learn medicine. Otherwise, you can always support us by donating on Patreon, subscribing to our channel, or following us on social media. ...about endometriosis, and this is really a- This is a condition that wants to know more about endometriosis. Endometriosis is a condition where there's endometrial tissue outside of the uterus, usually somewhere else in the pelvis. And when you have a lump of endometrial tissue outside the uterus, we can call it an endometrioma. When you have endometriomas in the ovaries, sometimes we can call them chocolate cysts.
So before we go any further, I just want to go through some basic anatomy from the pelvis. So here's a front-on view of what you might see in the pelvis, and you'd have the uterus, which is this structure in the middle where babies grow. The lining of the uterus is called the endometrium, and it's this red area in the middle, and this is what breaks down and gets released and bleeds during menstruation or during women's periods. Attached to the uterus, you've got the cervix and the entrance to the vagina, and then you have the fallopian tubes and the ovaries, which produce the eggs, and the eggs move down the fallopian tube to the uterus, where fertilization takes place and you get a pregnancy. Now look at this other diagram, which is the side-on view of the pelvis. You can see the uterus and the vagina, and then up here you can see one of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, and you can see how they relate to other structures, such as the bladder and the rectum back here. This little space between the uterus and the rectum is called the pouch of Douglas, and it's worth knowing about that because that's quite a common place for endometrial tissue to settle. So we don't really know what causes endometriosis, and there's no real cause that's been proven, but there's several theories. And one of the key theories is that during menstruation, as the endometrial lining starts to break down, and usually it would come out through the cervix and into the vagina like this, in some women it might actually flow backwards through the fallopian tubes and out into the pelvis. And this we call retrograde menstruation. After the endometrial tissue has passed out of the fallopian tubes into the pelvis, it then seeds itself, and you can get little pockets of endometrial tissue. Like I said before, we call it endometriomas. There are several other theories, like I said. One could be that it's spread through the lymphatic system in a similar way to how cancers metastasize. Or it could be that cells elsewhere somehow change in a process called metaplasia from their normal cell type to endometrial cells. There also seems to be a bit of a genetic component to developing endometriosis, but there's no particular endometriosis gene that's been found. But we do find that it does have a tendency to run in families. So once you get these cells that settle outside the uterus, they continue to respond to hormones in the same way as the endometrium in the uterus. So that means throughout the menstrual cycle, they develop and thicken, and then when it comes to menstruation, they also start to shed. And this bleeding elsewhere in the body causes irritation and inflammation of the tissues around the endometrial tissue. And this causes what we call a cyclical, because it responds to the menstrual cycle, it causes a cyclical, dull, heavy, or burning type of a pain that occurs around the same time or slightly before menstruation. And where you have deposits of endometriosis in the bladder or the bowel, this can lead to abnormal bleeding in these areas, so you could find that people with endometriosis in these areas have some blood in their urine or their stools during the time of menstruation. The other problem that occurs with endometriosis is that this localized bleeding and inflammation can lead to something called adhesions. So this is where the inflammation from the localized bleeding and the endometriosis causes damage to the local tissues, and as they heal, they develop scar tissue that binds them together. You end up with different organs attaching themselves to each other. For example, the ovaries could be attached to the lining of the pelvis called the peritoneum, or something like the uterus could be attached to the bowel. You can also get adhesions after having major surgery, and people with endometriosis quite often end up having recurrent surgeries, and this can contribute to the adhesions developing. And this leads to a chronic, non-cyclical, so it's not related to the menstrual cycle, abdominal and pelvic pain that can be sort of sharp or stabbing or pulling in nature, and it can make the patient feel quite sick or nauseated when it's happening. The other issue, other than a cyclical pain, or this chronic, non-cyclical pain related to adhesions, is that some women with endometriosis can struggle to become pregnant. However, it's important to remember that having endometriosis doesn't necessarily lead to reduced fertility. We're not really sure why some women with endometriosis struggle to get pregnant, but it could be due to adhesions around the ovaries and the fallopian tubes that either block the ovary from releasing the eggs or hold the tubes in abnormal positions, which prevent the egg from sort of moving along smoothly and reaching the uterus. Endometriomas in the ovaries could also cause local inflammation and damage the eggs or prevent effective ovulation, but often we can't find a clear reason for why the person with endometriosis is struggling with fertility. Just a side note on how we would treat reduced fertility in endometriosis. The number one method would be using surgery, and the intention of the surgery is basically to correct any of these possible causes of the infertility. So number one, we would clear any adhesions that might be surrounding the ovary or blocking any eggs from being released. Secondly, remove any cysts that might contain endometriosis on the ovaries so that we reduce the risk of inflammation in the area and ovulation and damage to the eggs. And the final thing would be to try and normalize as much as possible the structure and the position of the pelvis so that we optimize the chances of achieving a normal pregnancy. So how do we diagnose endometriosis if we have somebody who's having pains that we think are oh, they're cyclical, they're having particularly heavy periods, and we wonder whether they could have a diagnosis of endometriosis? Well, first, a thorough examination might reveal any other causes of this type of pain. Speculum examination might reveal some deposits of endometriosis in the vagina. Bimanual examination could reveal a fixed uterus, meaning that you can't easily move it with the tips of your fingers. And the cervix could be fixed in place, and it could be very tender deep inside the vagina, or you can also have a lot of adnexal tenderness. You can use a pelvic ultrasound which would reveal any large endometriomas or chocolate cysts in the ovaries, but often pelvic ultrasounds are unhelpful in that they're normal in people who have significant endometriosis. The gold standard way to diagnose endometriosis is using laparoscopic surgery, so using keyhole surgery to have a look inside the abdomen and try to spot any areas where endometrial tissue is placed outside of the uterus. And the useful thing about doing this surgery is that if you find endometrial tissue, it's possible to actually put some treatments in place such as cauterizing that tissue or actually excising it out. Just a quick word on the staging system for endometriosis. Stage one is where you only have very small superficial lesions of endometrial tissue outside the uterus. Stage two is where you would have deeper lesions, which include inside the pouch of Douglas. Stage three is where you have deep lesions, which would be in the pouch of Douglas, but also with lesions on the ovary itself. And then stage four would be deep and large lesions affecting the pouch of Douglas, the ovaries, and also extensive adhesions throughout the pelvis. Stage four is really the most extensive condition, most severe endometriosis. So finally, let's move on and have a quick look at the management options that we have. The main thing is to offer some analgesia for the person's chronic or cyclical pelvic pain. The first line really for treating endometriosis is to give hormonal medications that stop ovulation and reduce the amount of endometrial thickening. By stopping ovulation, you reduce the amount of estrogen and progesterone hormones that are thickening up the endometrium and then shedding during menstruation. 
So the way we can achieve this is using the combined oral contraceptive pill, or using progesterone such as medroxyprogesterone acetate in the depot injection, or by using the Mirena coil. All of these methods work to try to prevent ovulation and also to reduce the amount of endometrial thickening that happens. These hormonal methods will help with the cyclical pain, but they may not help with pain relating to the adhesions. The other thing that we find is that this cyclical pain tends to improve after menopause. So another option is to induce a medical menopause, and this can be done with something called GnRH analogs, such as guzarelin, which is commonly known as Zolidex injections. What they do is they shut down the ovaries temporarily, so they completely stop the whole menstrual cycle, and this can really make an improvement for the cyclical menstrual pain. The problem with inducing the menopause early is it does come with its own side effects, such as the hot flushes, night sweats, and thinning of the bones, similar to the symptoms that a menopausal woman would experience. The next option when the medical management of endometriosis has failed is surgery, and quite often women with endometriosis end up having several surgical procedures to try and treat the condition. Laparoscopic surgery or keyhole surgery can be used to find the endometrial tissue and then cut it out or cauterize it so that it stops producing that localized inflammation and pain. We can also use surgery to treat the chronic pelvic pain of women who've developed adhesions, where we go in and cut the adhesions out and separate everything and try and return the anatomy as far as we can to normal, and that quite often helps the chronic pelvic pain relating to the adhesions. And really the final step that can be used to try and treat women who are having really severe endometriosis that's not responding to any other treatments would be to do a hysterectomy and what we call a bilateral salpingoophorectomy, where we take out the ovaries and tubes as well. While we're doing this, we try and take out as much of the endometriosis as we can find at the same time, and removing the ovaries and removing the endometrial tissue itself will induce the menopause and should help to improve the symptoms. The problem is, this isn't a guaranteed method of curing the endometriosis, and there's no real effective cure for the condition. So it's a bit of a gamble whether this will work or not, and it's quite a drastic thing to have happen, especially to a younger woman. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources. This endometriosis. Next question. A 38-year-old soldier presents to the emergency department due to pain in her shin that has been present for two months now. Specifically, the pain is located over the tibia. Although the pain is generally relieved by rest, it is concerning that she has an upcoming three-day hike with the army. She has currently not had any in-hospital investigations. Examination, examination reveals diffuse tenderness over the tibia. She apologizes for coming to the emergency department and says that her GP did not have any appointments available for two weeks and needs advice before the weekend is over. What should you do next with regard to the management of this patient? Looks like there's diffuse tenderness over the tibia. Uh, there was no description of any skin nodules, so there's not erythema nodules. I mean, it could be us osteo what does it say infection of the bone advice going home and resting Oof. refer to orthopedics undertake an x-ray of the legs perform CT scan of the legs this leg in a plaster cast hmm. we're gonna see what's going on first right so you either do an x-ray or CT scan. Can x-ray detect a uh, bone infection? What do you call a bone infection again? Oh, can't remember. No mind. So do you take, take an x-ray or do you do a CT scan? CT scan you can see more. But usually you'll do an x-ray first, right? What should you do next? Have you taken an x-ray yet? No. So take an x-ray. Yep. A stress fracture, the tibia, is an important differential for tibial stress syndrome. So we're talking about stress fracture. The clue here is that she's a soldier. And she marches a lot. Okay. So no signs of fever or so. So why was I thinking of an infection anyway? Uh, what do you call infection of bone? Osteomyelitis. Yeah, that's what it's called. Okay, so this is not osteomyelitis. The most likely diagnosis is tibial stress syndrome. However, it would be unwise to discharge this patient without definitely ruling out a stress fracture of the tibia. Therefore, it would be, it would be appropriate to order an x-ray of the patient's legs. This is the initial investigation of choice. Symptoms often precede x-ray changes by a few weeks, but this patient has symptoms for now for two months. Note that you cannot use Ottawa ankle rules to determine if an x-ray is needed. Ottawa rules are used to determine if an ankle and or foot x-ray are needed. It is not sensitive for a tibial stress fracture. So Tawa will not heard of it before. Although CT and MRI are more sensitive, an X-ray would be performed first. 
CT, MRI more sensitive, X-ray performed first. Yes. If there is no definitive answer for the imaging may be required, a plaster cast would be inappropriate at this stage as tibial stress syndrome is the most likely diagnosis. An orthopedic referral is currently inappropriate at this stage, assuming the X-ray rules out the tibial stress fracture, breast elevation uh, of the leg, and repeated ice packing of the leg would be an appropriate management plan. Stress fractures. Repetitive activity or and loading of normal bone may result in small hairline fractures. Whilst this may be painful, they are seldom displaced. Surrounding soft tissue injury is unusual. They may present late following the injury in which cause in which case callus formation may be identified on radiographs. Such cases may not require formal immobilization. Injuries associated with severe pain and presenting at an earlier stage may benefit from immobilization tailored to the site of injury. No notes here on the stress fracture. Hmm. Tibial stress syndrome. You have a radiopedia article on this would be very convenient. Auto bullets is more detailed. Overuse injury or repetitive injury of the shin area that includes medial posterior medial tibial stress syndrome. Where's this? This doesn't look like an X ray. This is an MRI. See some hyper intensities here mm, I don't know what's this this is definitely not an x-ray right such bad quality if it's an x-ray hmm overuse injury or repetitive load injury of the shin area that includes medial posterior medial um, tibial stress syndrome, most common anterior and anterior lateral tibial stress syndrome epidemiology incidence is 10 to 15 percent of running injuries uh, 60% of leg pain syndromes. Location distal to posterior medial T distal and posterior medial tibia. Risk factors include runners without enough shock absorbent running on cement or uneven surfaces, improper running shoes, training errors, sudden increase in training intensity and duration, running more than 20 miles per week, heel training every Early in the season, history of previous lower extremity injuries, overpronation or increased internal tibial rotation, pathophysiology caused by traction periostitis. Uh, I don't know what that means. Anterior lateral traction periostitis of tibialis anterior on tibia interosseous membrane, posterior medial traction periostitis of tibialis posterior and soleus. What that means, associated conditions, female athlete triad. Critical to diagnose and treat tibial stress fractures, females have 1.5 to 3.5 increased risk of progression to stress fractures. Presentation symptoms vague, diffuse pain along media, middle distal tibia that decreases with running early stage. Differentiate from exertional compartment syndrome for which pain increases with running. Earlier onset of pain with more frequent training later stages. Physical exam, tenderness along posterior middle bit, border of the tibia, falsely and proximal to medial malleus, extending approximately up to 12 centimeters, past planus, tight achilles tendon, weak core muscles, pro provocative test, pain on resisted plantar flexion. Hmm, I guess it's a common thing in runners. Okay, next question. You have been working in a local GP for four months. A patient who you know well and have seen regularly for his chronic asthma states he would like to thank you for your hard work and kindness. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a 50 pounds in cash. Is this pounds or euros? I don't know. He says he would like you to take it as a Christmas gift and that he looks forward to having frequent consultations with you the new year. What did you do? Politely decline and state you are unable to receive gifts. Refuse to see the patient again. No, that's a bit extreme. Take the money and say thank you. Nope, that's not the way. Uh, state that you can't take it directly, but you found it in your po coat pocket. You could not refuse. What the heck? State you cannot receive money, but can receive gifts. Nope. Okay, so the first is the only possible answer. It's like common sense. 
A 62-year-old man presents with nocturia hesitancy and terminal dribbling. Prostate examination reveals a moderately enlarged prostate. Nocturia appearing in the night, hesitancy, terminal dribbling. Okay, so it's BPH uh, with no irregular features and a well-defined median sulcus. Blood tests show PSA 1.3 nanograms per milliliter. What's the most appropriate management? Is this normal or low? Uh? Mm. Don't know what's the normal value. So the most appropriate management um, for benign prostatic hyperplasia, how do you treat it? I think it's 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. It inhibits the conversion of something to testosterone, right? Testosterone causes enlargement of prostate or something like that. Okay, let's see. Oh, nope. The answer is alpha 1 antagonist. Okay. Let's see, alpha-1 antagonists are first line in patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay, some brief notes on benign prostatic hyperplasia. Benign prostatic hyperplasia is a common condition seen in older men. Risk factors include age around 50% of 50-year-old men will have the incidence of BPH and 30% will have symptoms. Around 80% of 80 year old men will have evidence of BPH. Ethnicity black, more than white, more than Asian. BPH typically presents with lower urinary tract symptoms, LUTS, which may be categorized into voiding symptoms, which is obstructive, weak or intermittent urinary flow, straining, hesitancy, terminal dribbling, and incomplete emptying. Storage symptoms, which is irritative urgency, frequency, urgency, incontinence, and nocturia. Post-micturation post tripling, complications, uh, urinary tract infection, retention, obstructive uropathy. Management options include watchful waiting, medication, alpha-1 antagonists, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, the use of combination therapy was supported by the medical therapy of prosthetic symptoms, MTOPS trial, surgery, transuretral resection of the prostate, TURP. Alpha-1 antagonists, for example, temsulosin, alfonsolicin, uh, decreased smooth muscle tone, prostate and bladder. Considered first line. Um, improved symptoms in around 70% of men. Adverse effects include dizziness, postural hypotension, dry mouth depression. 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, for example, finasteride, block the conversion of testosterone, or is testosterone to DHT, block conversion of testosterone to DHT dihydrotestosterone, which is the known to induce BPH. This is far more potent than the normal testosterone. I think the alpha-1 antagonist, uh, unlike alpha-1 antagonist, causes a reduction in prostate volume and hence may slow disease progression. This, however, takes time and symptoms may not improve for six months. They may also decrease PSA concentration by up to 50%. Adverse effects include erectile dysfunction, Right. Oh yeah, because we don't have DHT. So erectile dysfunction, reduced libido, ejaculation problems, gynecomastia. Okay, so first line is alpha-1 antagonist. Over here, lower urinary tract symptoms in men. Hmm. Over here, you have the flow chart. And then over here, you have a uh, man with LUTS, initial assessment, information support, meant to refer to specialists. So where is the normal PSA values? Huh? I don't know. DRE, LUTS, IPSS. Hmm. IPSS stands for International Prostate. Symptom score. Management. Let's see. All moderate bothersome LUTS. Conservative management. Drug management. 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. Larger than 30 grams or more than 1.5 nanograms per ml. 1.4. Hmm. Okay. 
Voiding and storage symptoms. Storage symptoms not caused by enlarged prostate. Post maturation dribble, how to perform urethral milking. Inform men with early tears and proven proven bladder out of obstruction that bladder retraining is less effective than surgery. Offer intermittent bladder catheterization before indwelling urethral or suprapubic catheterization to men avoiding LUTS that cannot be corrected by less invasive measures. Consider offering long-term indwelling urethral catheterization men LUTS for whom medical management have failed and surgery not appropriate and who are unable to manage intermittent self-catheterization or with skin wounds, patch ulcers, irritation that being Stress by bit and coding changes. Hmm. Waiting symptoms. Of a man with storage of UTS. Symptoms include daytime infrequency, nocturia, urgency, urinary incontinence, particularly urinary incontinence, temporary containment products, for example, pads or collecting devices, to achieve social inc social continence until diagnosis and management can be discussed. Offer a choice of containment products to manage storage of UTS, particularly or urinary incontinence based on individual circumstances and in consultation with the men OAB overactive bladder supervised bladder training supervised pelvic floor muscle training do not offer penile clamps of external collecting devices consider permanent use of containment products drug treatment take into account communities of the drug treatment to men with borders only to men with borders and LTS do not use PDA5 inhibitors solely for the purpose of treating LUTS in men except as part of a randomized controlled trial. PDA5 inhibitors, phosphodiester 5 inhibitors, I think it's a um, Viagra or something. This one is uh, not, uh, it's 5 alpha reductase different. Offer alpha blocker, aflozin, aflozosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin, terazosin to men with moderate to severe LUTS. Consider offering anticholinergics as well as an alpha blocker to men who still have storage symptoms after treatment of alpha blockers alone. Over here, the drug treatment is just a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. Offer 5 alpha reductase inhibitor to men with LUTS who have prostates estimated to be larger than 30 grams or PSA level greater than 1.4 nanograms per ml and who are considered to be high risk of progression, for example, older men. Considering offer a combination of alpha blocker and a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor to men with bothersome moderate to severe LTS and prostates and estimate to, to be larger than 30 grams or a PSA level of greater than 1.4 nanograms per ml. Often alpha blocker, alpha lozine, dosazosine, tapsolazine, or terazosine to men with moderate to severe L-U-T-S mm. 
Okay. Moderate IPSS score of 8 to 19 and severe 20 to 35. So basically, it's use a uh, alpha blockers. Mm. Unless it's very big, then you want to give oh, five alpha reductase inhibitors. More than one point four in the grass family. Not a normal value though. It's not written here as well. Let's look at osmosis PPH video. <laughs> Learning medicine is hard work. In benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, prostatic refers to the prostate gland. Hyperplasia means an increase in the number of cells, and benign means that these cells aren't malignant, so they don't invade neighboring tissues. Basically, benign prostatic hyperplasia is the non-cancerous growth of the prostate gland. This condition is common in men over 50, and it's often considered a normal part of aging. The prostate is a small gland, about the size and shape of a walnut, that sits under the bladder and in front of the rectum. The urethra, which is the tube through which the urine leaves the bladder, goes through the prostate before reaching the penis. And that part of the urethra is called the prostatic urethra. The prostate is covered by a capsule of tough connective tissue and smooth muscle. Beneath this layer, the prostate can be divided into a few zones. The peripheral zone, which is the outermost posterior section, is the largest of the zones and contains about 70% of the prostate's glandular tissue. Moving inward, the next section is the central zone, which contains about 25% of the glandular tissue as well as the ejaculatory ducts that join with the prostatic urethra. Last is the transitional zone, which contains around 5% of the glandular tissue as well as a portion of the prostatic urethra. The transitional zone gets its name because it contains transitional cells, which are also found in the bladder. At the microscopic level, each of the tiny glands that make up the prostate is surrounded by a basement membrane made largely of collagen. Sitting within that basement membrane is a ring of cube-shaped basal cells, as well as a few neuroendocrine cells interspersed throughout. Finally, there's an inner ring of luminal columnar cells, which are within the lumen, or center of the gland. Luminal cells secrete substances into the prostatic fluid that make it slightly alkaline and give it nutrients which nourish the sperm and help it survive in the acidic environment of the vagina. During an ejaculation, sperm leave the testes, travel through the vas deferens, into the ejaculatory ducts, and travel through the prostatic urethra. Smooth muscles in the prostate contract and push the prostatic fluid into the urethra, where it joins the sperm as well as the semen, which is the fluid that comes from the seminal vesicles. The luminal cells also produce prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, which helps to liquefy the gel-like semen after ejaculation, thereby freeing the sperm to swim. The basal cells and luminal cells of the prostate rely on stimulation from the androgens, or male sex hormones, for survival. The androgens include testosterone, which is produced by the testicles, and dihydrotestosterone, which is produced in the prostate itself. This androgen is produced by the prostatic enzyme 5-alpha reductase, which converts testosterone into the more potent dihydrotestosterone. Since androgens are steroids, they can cross the cell membrane and bind to the androgen receptors within the cell's nucleus. This inhibits apoptosis, or programmed cell death, allowing luminal and basal cells in the prostate to keep growing and multiplying. Dihydrotestosterone is 10 times more potent than testosterone because it can bind to androgen receptors much longer. Now, after the age of 30, men produce about 1% less testosterone per year. But for unclear reasons, 5-alpha reductase activity increases with age, so even with less testosterone, there can be an increase in dihydrotestosterone. Normal prostate cells respond to the increase in dihydrotestosterone levels by living longer and multiplying, and that's the underlying cause of benign prostatic hypertrophy. This is a normal process of aging, and around 50% of men develop BPH by the age of 60, and over 90% have it by the age of 85. Fortunately, in BPH, there's no increased risk for developing cell mutations that lead to prostate cancer. Rather, the entire prostate gland enlarges pretty uniformly, and small hyperplastic nodules can form within it. These nodules are smooth, elastic, and firm, and are sometimes mistaken for prostate cancer. Typically, hyperplastic nodules will form in the inner portions of the gland, specifically around the prostatic urethra, called the periurethral zone. When these nodules, or the prostate tissue itself, compresses the prostatic urethra, it becomes more difficult for urine to pass through it. So, the urine builds up in the bladder, causing it to dilate. In response, the smooth muscle walls of the bladder will contract harder, and this leads to bladder hypertrophy, where the walls thicken and become easily irritated. Finally, the stagnation of urine in the bladder also promotes bacterial growth and can lead to urinary tract infections. Symptoms of BPH start up when the prostatic urethra gets obstructed, and that can lead to a weak and inconsistent stream of urine, called dribbling. The person might also have to strain when urinating to overcome the obstruction, have pain during urination, called dysuria, or trouble initiating urination, called hesitancy. As urine builds up in the bladder, it causes a constant sense of incomplete bladder emptying, which increases the frequency of urination at night, called nocturia. Benign prostatic hyperplasia can be identified with a digital rectal examination, which is where a finger is inserted into the rectum to feel against the anterior wall of the rectum, which lies along the posterior prostate. An enlarged prostate could indicate benign prostatic hyperplasia, while hard nodules could be a sign of prostate cancer. Levels of prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, a substance produced by healthy prostate cells, are also elevated in benign prostatic hyperplasia, since there are more cells around making the PSA. Treatment of BPH focuses on relieving the obstruction and allowing the urine to flow normally. This can be done through medications like finasteride, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which shrinks the prostate gland by inhibiting the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. Next, alpha-1 antagonists like phenoxybenzamine can bind to A1 receptors on the smooth muscles in the neck of the bladder, the prostate, and urethra, causing them to relax and allow urine to pass. In some cases, surgical procedures like transurethral resection of the prostate, or TERP, can be done to remove part or all of the prostate. Alright, as a quick recap. 
Benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, is a condition caused by increased 5-alpha reductase activity in the prostate, which leads to increased dihydrotestosterone production, and prostate hyperplasia. This is considered to be a normal part of aging and doesn't increase the risk of developing prostate cancer. The enlarged prostate gland can obstruct the prostatic urethra, which will lead to urine retention, causing the bladder to dilate and hypertrophy. Symptoms of BPH include urinary problems like urinary hesitancy, dysuria, dribbling, feeling of bladder fullness, and nocturia. BPH treatments include medications like 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, alpha-1 antagonists, or a TERP procedure. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, take a look at osmosis. Well, that's BPH for you. What are the normal PSE levels? Median PSA for this age range. What was this age range? Okay, for men in their 40s and 50s, PSA of greater than 2.5 nanograms per ml is considered abnormal. For men in their 60s, PSA score of greater than 4 nanograms per ml. This is only 1.3. 60. Hmm. Normal range between 1 and 1.5 nanograms per ml. Okay. This is still normal levels. Next question. A 46-year-old woman presents with acute, uh, acutely with type 2 necrotizing fasciitis. What's type 2? I know necrotizing fasciitis, but I don't know it has types. A culture of the wound grows gram-positive cocci in chains. The streptococci. What's the most likely? Causative organism. It is in chains, so it's not staphylococcus, because staphylococcus is great like cross clusters. E. coli is a uh, rod. It's a gram positive. Is positive or negative? I don't know. Vibrio bonificus doesn't sound like a streptococcus to me. It sounds like a rod, maybe. Streptococcus pyogenes is a streptococcus. Mm -hmm. Is it common for necrotizing fasciitis? Oh, yeah, I think necrotizing fasciitis is. Um, is uh, fact based on the organism. I can't remember what organism is type 2, but this gram positive cocci in chain is Streptococcus radiculostridium. I don't know how it looks like. So the answer is Streptococcus pyogenes. Streptococcus pyogenes is the most common cause of type 2 necrotizing fasciitis. Streptococcus pyogenes is the most common cause of type 2 neck fast. Staphylococcus aureus is usually found in clusters. Fibrio vulnificus is a gram negative rod that is a rare cause of type 3 necrotizing fasciitis. E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa are both gram negative rods that can cause type 1 necrotizing fasciitis. Clostridium perfringens is a gram positive rod that can cause type 1 necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is a medical emergency that's difficult to recognize in the early stages. It can be classified according to a causative origin. Some type 1 is caused by mixed anaerobes and aerobes. Often occurs post-surgery in diabetics. It is one of the most common type. Type 2 is caused by streptococcus pyogenes. Risk factors include skin factors, recent trauma, burns or soft tissue infections, diabetes mellitus, the most common persisting con medical condition, uh, particularly if the patient is treated with SGLT2 inhibitors. Intravenous drug use, immunosuppression, the most commonly affected site is the perineum, borneus, gangrene. Features include acute onset, pain, swelling, erythema at the affected site, often presents a rapidly worsening cellulitis and pain, all keeping in physical features. Uh, extremely tender over infected tissue with hypoesthesia to light touch, skin necrosis, and capillus gas gangrene are late, sign, late signs. Fever and tachycardia may be absent or occur late in the presentation. Management includes urgent surgical referral development. Intravenous antibiotics prognosis average mortality about 20 but that's very high. One in five people die from this. I think the net has more types of neck fast. See got one type one, type two, type three, and others. Type one polymicrobial, more than one bacteria involved. Type two due to hemolytic group A streptococcus or streptococcus pyogenes, I think. Mm. And staphylococci, including methicillin resistant strains. Type 3 is gang gas gangrene due to clostridium, and the uh, last med notes it says clostridium is under type 1. 
right? Where did it say Clostridium? Type 1. But over here it says it's type 3. Other marine organisms, Vibrio species, those others. Consider type 3 in some reports. Other infections, Candida. Alright, alright. Next question. A 71 year old man presents to GP with symptoms of urinary hesitancy, terminal dribbling, and nocturia. Sounds like I'm the BTDH. Terminal dribbling, nocturia, urinary hesitancy. A digital rectal examination reveals a hard, craggy prostate. Okay, this time sounds more like cancer. His prostate specific antigen, PSA, is shown below 10. So the normal is less than 5. Mm, which of following is the most appropriate action for the GP to take? So, what do you do as a GP? Refer to multi-parametric re magnetic resonance imaging. Refer for transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. Repeat PSA in two weeks. Mm. The PSA is already abnormal. The DRE already show craggy heart prostate. Uh, indicative of a malignancy. So better just refer la right. Nope, the answer is do an MRI before you do a biopsy, huh? Most people answer what I answer though. Multiparametric MRI has replaced TRUS, which is transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, as the first time investigation in suspected prostate cancer. Oh, is this a new thing? Multiparametric MRI. The correct answer is refer for multiparametric MRI. This patient is presenting with symptoms and examination findings that are suspicious of prostate cancer. His PSA is also raised. As such, he needs a referral for further investigations. Previously, the first line investigation was a transrectal, uh, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. Transrectal ultrasound TRUS biopsy. Ultrasound guided biopsy, however, NICE now advocates the use of multiparametric MRI before a biopsy. Tempsulosin is an alpha blocker that can be prescribed to help with benign prostatic hyperplasia. However, this patient has suspicious symptoms and abnormal prostate on DRE and raised PSA, so needs investigation for possible prostate cancer. Reassuring the patient that no action is needed would be inappropriate as they need to be investigated for possible prostate cancer. A TRUS biopsy, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, used to be the first line investigation for suspected prostate cancer. However, multiparametric MRI is now preferred initially. In some cases, this may be appropriate to repeat. It may be appropriate to repeat PSA if you suspect there were alternative reasons for it to be increased. For example, a recent urinary tract infection and there would be no suspicious features on examination. However, given the findings on DRA, this would be inappro inappropriate in this patient. So let's see prostate cancer investigations. The traditional investigations for suspected prostate cancer was transrectal ultrasound guided TRUS biopsy. However, recent guidelines from NICE have now advocated the increasing use of multiparametric MRI as first line investigation. Complications of TRUS biopsy hmm. Sepsis in 1% of cases, pain lasting more than 2 weeks in 15% severe in 7% fever in 5% hematuria and rectal bleeding. Multiparametric MRI is now the first line investigation for people suspected clinically localized prostate cancer. The results are reported using a 5-point Likert scale. The Likert scale is uh, 3 or more. A, if the Likert scale is 3 or more, a multiparametric MRI influence prostate biopsy is offered. If the Likert scale is 1 to 2, then I recommend discussing with the patient the pros and cons of having a biopsy. So do MRI before biopsy. Okay, next question. Do I should I okay now just go see? From here assessment information supporting diagnosis. Do not routinely offer multiparametric MRI to people with prostate cancer who are not going to be able to have radical treatment. 
of a multiple uh, multi-parametric MRI. An MRI study that incorporates anatomical and functional information about the prostate. The minimum functional information includes T2-weighted, diffusion-weighted imaging, and dynamic contrast enhanced imaging. Offer multi-parametric MRI as a first-line investigation for people with suspected clinically localized prostate cancer. Report the results using a five-point Likert scale. Offer multi-parametric MRI influence prostatic biopsy. The information from the MPMRI scan taken before prostate biopsy is used to determine the best needle placement. In rare cases, the biopsy may be MRI guided. The needle is inserted within the MRI machine. In most cases, the biopsy that follows the MPMRI will be ultrasound guided, but the specific areas targeted will be predetermined by the MPMRI data. Because scale is three or more. So multi-parametric MRI uses T2 weighted, diffusion weighted. We want to see the anatomical and functional. See, let's read this again. Multi-parametric MRI is an MRI study that incorporates an anatomical and functional information of the prostate. The minimum functional information includes T2 weighted, diffusion weighted imaging, and dynamic contrast enhanced imaging. So that's the new guidelines. Do this before you biopsy. Next question, a 58-year-old woman presents to her GP for a review of her angina. Although her symptoms have improved, she reports that she is still experiencing chest pain on exertion and needing to use her GTN spray despite taking the maximum dose of her medications. Her current medications include GTN spray, metformin, remipril, and tanolol. What is the most appropriate management? So, she is having a stable angina, stable angina management is um my stable angina management a is inhibitor beta blocker i don't know le. is this a correct abst is inhibitor beta blocker statin and Diuretic? No, that's for heart failure. I don't know what is the guidelines on civil angina. So she's on metformin, she's on remipril, and she's on natanolol. Tanolol is a beta blocker, I think. Beta 1 selective one. I think. Remipril is ace inhibitor, metformin is for diabetes. Hmm think she can have something else why if her brother of a female over a tenor what's she having Philippine. She's not on CCB yet, so maybe can add the Philippine. But adding verapamil will be quite bad. Uh, you need to caution when you add verapamil, which is a rate limiting CCB with a beta blocker. So I guess in this case, add the Philippine. I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's get it wrong and learn from that. Oh, correct. Okay, so add nifedipine is the answer. If angina is not controlled with a beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker should be added. The correct answer is add nifedipine. The patient is still experiencing angina symptoms despite the initiation of beta blocker, which has been titrated to the maximum dose as such. The next step is to add on a calcium channel blocker. When combining calcium channel blocker with a beta blocker, long-acting calcium channel blocker such as nifedipine is recommended. Add evabradine is incorrect as a long-acting nitrate should only be considered as an add-on if the patient cannot tolerate the combination of beta blocker and calcium channel blocker. Add verapamil is incorrect. While verapamil is a calcium channel blocker, it should not be prescribed alongside a beta blocker due to the risk of complete heart block. 
Stop at the low and start evaporating is incorrect. Long acting nitrates should not be generally used as uh, be used as monotherapy and should only be considered as an add-on if the patient cannot tolerate the combination of beta blocker and calcium channel blocker. Stop ethanol and start vampirin is incorrect. This may may have been appropriate if the patient could not tolerate a beta blocker. However, she is tolerating her ethanol and still experiencing symptoms, so needs additional medication prescribing. Angina pectoris drug management. So the management of stable angina comprises lifestyle changes, medication, percutaneous coronary intervention, and surgery. NICE produced guidelines in 2011 covering the management of stable angina. Medication. All patients should receive aspirin and statin in the absence of any contraindication. Sublingual glycerol translated to ab abort angina attacks. NICE recommend using either a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. First line based on comorbidities contraindications and a person's preference. If a calcium channel blocker is used as monotherapy, a rate-limiting one such as verapamil or diltiazem should be used. If used in combination with beta blocker, then it, let me read again huh, because I'm not out of focus. Medication. All patients should receive aspirin and a statin in the absence of any contraindications. Aspirin and statin, okay. Subligual, sublingual glycerol trinitrate to abort angina attacks. Nice recommend using a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker first line based on comorbidities, contradiction, and person's preference. If a calcium channel blocker is used as monotherapy, a rate limiting one such as vampirmil or diatizum should be used. If used in combination with beta blocker, then use a long acting DHP calcium block channel blocker, for example, modified release nifedipine. Remember that beta blockers should not be pre co prescribed, cannot, should not be prescribed concurrently with verapamil or risk of complete heart block. If there is poor response to initial treatment, then medication should be increased to the maximum tolerated dose, for example, a tunnel 100 mg OD. If a patient is still symptomatic after monotherapy with a beta blocker, add a calcium channel blocker and vice versa. If a patient is on monotherapy and cannot tolerate the addition of a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker, then consider one of the following drugs along acting nitrate, evabradine, nicorandil, or ranolazine. If a patient is taking both a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker, then only add a third drug whilst the patient is awaiting assessment for PCI or CAPG. Nitrate tolerance. Many patients who take nitrates develop tolerance and experience reduced efficacy. NICE advises that patients who take standard release isosorbic mononitrate Use an asymmetric dosing interval to maintain a daily nitrate free time at 10 to 14 hours to a free time of 10 to 14 hours to minimize the development of nitrate tolerance. This effect is not seen in patients who take one daily modified release isosorbic mononitrate. Mm, okay, so here is nice guidelines. Is there a summary? Summary version, chest pain. No, oh, it's a PowerPoint. Oh man. This one? Clinical case scenarios. Presented instruction. Okay, now mind. We'll just go for the normal table. Then. Hmm, assessing a diagnosis, suspected, stable angina, information and support. Management of suspected acute coronary syndrome. This is stable chest pain, physical examination, breathlessness, okay, risk factors, typicality, so as typical and atypical. Presence of three of the features below is defined as typical angina. Presence of two of the three features below is defined as atypical angina. Presence of one or none of the features below is defined as non-angina chest pain. So the pain, the features include constricting discomfort of front of the chest or in the neck, shoulders, jaws, or arms. Okay. 
mm, precipitated by physical exertion, relieved by rest or GTN within about five minutes. Do not define typical and atypical features of angina chest pain and non-angina chest pain differently in men and women. Do not define typical and atypical features of angina chest pain and non-angina chest pain differently in ethnic groups. Uh, unless clinical suspicion is raised based on other aspects of the history and risk factors, exclude a diagnosis of stable angina if the pain is non-angina. Features which make a diagnosis of stable angina unlikely are when the chest pain is continuous or very prolonged and or unrelated to activity or brought on by breathing in and or associated with symptoms such as dizziness, palpitations, tingling, or difficulty swallowing. Okay, uh, then non angina chest pain. Consider causes of chest pain other than angina, such as GI or musculoskeletal pain. Only consider chest x ray if other diagnoses such as lung tumor are suspected. Do not offer diagnostic testing to people with non angina chest pain on clinical assessment unless there are uh, resting ECG or ST or Q waves. Uh, resting ECG, ST or Q waves. Huh? Okay. If a diagnosis of stable angina has been excluded at any point in the care pathway, but if people have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, follow the appropriate guidance. Initial management investigations arrange blood tests to identify conditions to exacerbate an angina such as anemia for all people being investigated for stable angina. Consider aspirin only if the person's chest pain is likely to be stable angina. Aspirin only if it's likely to be stable angina. Until a diagnosis is made, do not offer additional aspirin if there is a clear evidence that people are already taking aspirin regularly or are allergic to it. Uh, follow the recommendations of managing stable angina while waiting for the results of investigations. If symptoms are typical of stable angina, ECG mm, cannot be excluded on BC or clinical assessment alone. Take a resting 12 day ECG as soon as possible. Our documentation do not rule out that it's stable angina on basis on normal resting 12 day ECG. Number of changes of testing to the ACG are considered coronary artery disease and may indicate ischemia or previous infection. They include pathologic Q waves, in particular left bundle branch block, ST segment, and T wave abnormalities, for example, platinum or inversion. Note that the results may not be conclusive. Diagnostic investigation. Include the typicality of angina pain features in all requests for diagnostic investigations and in person's notes. Use clinical judgment to take into account people's preferences and comorbidities when considering diagnostic testing. First line, 64 slice CT coronary angio. Offer 64 slice or above CT coronary angiography if clinical assessment indicates typical or atypical angina or clinical Assessment indicates non angina chest pain, but 12 day ECG has been done indicates ST changes or Q waves. CT and Joe. Uh, so, typically of chest pain again, 2 is atypical, 3 is typical, 1 or 0 is non angina. First line is 64 slice CT and Joe. Second line is non invasive functional testing. Offer non invasive functional imaging for myocardial ischemia in 64 slice or above CT and GO has, not, has shown coronary artery disease of uncertain functional significance or is it non diagnostic. When offering non invasive functional imaging for myocardial ischemia, use MPS with spec myocardial perfusion scintigraphy with single photon emission CT or stress echo echocardiography or first pass contrast enhanced magnetic resonance perfusion or MRI for stress induced fall motion on these. Mm, well, okay. That line is invasive coronary angiography. Okay, confirm diagnosis of stable angina and continue investigation. Stable angina. Okay, managing. How to manage information support. Mm, general principles. 
Do not exclude people with stable angina for treatment based on their age alone. Do not investigate or treat symptoms of stable angina differently in men and women, different ethnic groups. Treatment that should not be offered. We'll not talk about that. What things to offer? Offer short-acting nitrate for preventing and treating episodes of angina. Advise people with stable angina how to administer the short-acting nitrate to use it immediately before or any planned exercise or exertion. That side effects such as flashing, headache, and lightheadedness may occur to sit down or find something to hold on to if feeling lightheaded. When a short-acting nitrate is being used to treat episodes of angina, advise people to repeat the dose after 5 minutes the pain is not gone. Call emergency ambulance if the pain is not gone in 5 minutes after taking a second dose. Offer optimal drug treatment. Offer people with optimal drug treatment for the initial management of stable angina. Optimal drug treatment consists of one or two antiangional drugs such as less, less necessary plus drugs for secondary prevention or cardiovascular disease. Advise people that the aim of antiangional drug treatment is to prevent episodes of angina and the aim of secondary prevention treatment is to prevent cardiovascular events such as heart attack and stroke. For treating stable angina. Most people aim for intelligence to prevent episodes of angina and the aim of secondary prevention treatments to prevent cardiovascular events. Oh, okay, so there's a treatment of angina and there's a secondary prevention for cardiovascular disease. Okay, so treatment for stable angina discuss how side effects of drug treatment might affect the person's daily activity and explain why it's important to take drug treatment regularly. Review the person's response to treatment, include any side effects two to two, four weeks after starting or changing drug treatment, titrate the dose so the drug dosage against the patient's symptoms up to the maximum tolerable dosage. First line treatment offer either a beta blocker or CCB as first line treatment for stable angina. Decide which drug to use based on comorbidities, contraindications, and the person's preference. If the person cannot tolerate a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, consider switching to the other option, calcium channel blocker or beta blocker. If the person's symptoms are not satisfactory, control on beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, consider either switching to or either, uh, the other option or using combination of the two. When combining calcium channel blocker with a beta blocker, use a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, for example, slow release that nephedipine, allodipine, or felodipine. Do not routinely offer anti-angenal and general drugs other than beta blockers or calcium channel blockers as first-line treatment for stable angina. If the person cannot tolerate beta blockers and calcium channel blockers or both are contraindicated, consider monotherapy with one of the following drugs, a long-acting nitrate or ifepredine or nicarandil or renalazine. Mm. Decide which drug to use based on comorbidities, contraindications, and a person's reference to drugs cost. For people on a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, monotherapy whose symptoms are not controlled and the other option, calcium channel blocker or beta blocker is contraindicated or not tolerated, consider one of the following as an additional drug. Long acting nitrate, ipropredine, nicarandil, renalazine. Want to offer a third drug? Do not offer a third anti adrenal drug to people whose stable angina is controlled with two anti adrenal drugs. Consider adding a third anti adrenal drug only when the person's symptoms are not satisfactory controlled with two anti adrenal drugs and the person is waiting for revascularization or revascularization is not considered appropriate or acceptable. Decide which drug to use based on comorbidities, contraindications, and personal preference. Then, so and then general drugs, you got beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and uh, so these two are the first line. Uh. So if one of them contraindicated, then you can add uh, ivabradine or long acting nitrate or nicorandil or something else. Phenalazine. Um, if both inter contraindicated, then you can do monotherapy of ivabradine or long acting nitrate or uh, nicorandil or phenalazine. And then, if you want to offer third drug, make sure you refer first. Refer for revascularization. Then, 
drugs for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Consider aspirin 75 mg daily for people with stable angina, taking into account the risk of bleeding and comorbidities. Consider ACE inhibitors for people with stable angina and diabetes. Offer or continue ACE inhibitors for other conditions in line with relevant NICE guidelines. Offer statin treatment in line with NICE pathway and lipid modification therapy. Offer treatment for high blood pressure in line with NICE pathway and hypertension. So these are the secondary prevention stuff. Cardiac syndrome X. Do not routinely offer drugs for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease to people with suspected cardiac syndrome X. What is cardiac syndrome X? Cardiac syndrome X is a condition characterized by angina-like chest discomfort, as they act in depression during exercise, and normal coronary epicardia arteries and angiography has the highest prevalence in postmenopausal women. Yeah, so it's a weird cardiac syndrome. Rivaroxaban, the following recommendation from NICE. Rivaroxaban plus aspirin is recommended within its marketing authorization as an option for preventing atherothrombotic events in adults with coronary artery disease or symptomatic peripheral artery disease who are at high risk of ischemic events. For people with coronary artery disease, high risk of ischemic events is defined as age 65 or over or atherosclerosis in at least two vascular territories such as coronary, cerebrovascular, or peripheral arteries. Or two or more of the following risk factors, current smoking, diabetes, kidney dysfunction, heart failure, previous non-lacunar ischemic stroke. Assess the person's risk of bleeding before considering river oxygen. Treatment should only be started after an informed decision with the team for with them about the risk and benefits of river oxygen, weighing up the risk of anti-thrombotic events against the risk of bleeding. The risk and benefits of continuing treatment with river oxygen should be regularly reviewed. So you want to give um, statins, you want to give antihypertensive, you want to give ACE inhibitors, and what's the other one? Aspirin. Aspirin, statin, ACE inhibitors, and antihypertensive based on if they have diabetes. They have high blood pressure, three high blood pressure, if they have high cholesterol. It's a curious score. And they have diabetes, three diabetes, keep ACE inhibitors, keep aspirin. Okay. Okay, so that's the management of stable angina. Hmm. Should I dive into this? How much time do I have I used? Already more than one hour. Okay, la, let's just finish this quickly. Three more questions. Next question. You're a junior doctor on the labor ward and are called by your midwife to delivery in which baby's head have been delivered, but the shoulders will not deliver with a normal download traction. So there is shoulder dystocia. Which of the which of these is your first step in management of this condition? So in shoulder shoulder dystocia, how do you manage? Mm. There's a mnemonic we can use. Helper. Helper mnemonic. It's the other mnemonic. It's more suitable one. Alarm. Alarmer. A for ask for help. L for. Uh, L for what? Legs. Mac Roberts maneuver. E L A A for the other A is for what? Release the posterior arm, is it? R is rotate. So do the wood screw maneuver, right? Uh, M. The other M is for what? Uh, 
No, M is for maneuver. R is for what? Release posterior arm. A L A. What's the A for? Maneuver, maneuver. Remember. Anyway, first step is to ask for help, lah. Ask the mother to hyperflex your leg. So over here, there's no option for asking for help. So the second one is for the McRoberts maneuver. Uh, legs. McRoberts maneuver. Ask the mother to hyperflex your legs and apply suprapubic pressure. Ah. Apply. A for apply suprapubic pressure. Yeah. So A L E R M E R. The first A is for ask for help. L is for legs. So McRoberts maneuver. So hyperflex legs. A is for apply suprapubic pressure, R is for release posterior arm, uh, M is for maneuver root boot screw maneuver, uh, which is the rotation, and then um, E is for uh, consider episiotomy, and R is for roll out all fours. So now, yeah. Okay, sequence of action is recommended in shoulder dystocia. Initially, request for senior help and ask the mother to hyperflex her legs. Also, call McRoberts maneuver and apply suprapubic pressure. This method works in 90% of cases. If this method fails, episiotomy is required to allow internal maneuvers. A number of potential options, including wood screw maneuver and grasping the manipulation of posterior arm, are then possible. Last results include symphysiotomy and Zavanelli maneuver, which includes cesarean section. However, by this point, fetal damage is often irreversible. So should the dystocia... Hmm... Thing so far got the sequence quite right. Remember the morning I'm alarmer. Okay, next question. A 62 year old female is admitted with a suspected infective exacerbation on COPD. A chest x ray shows evidence or no evidence of consolidation. What is the most likely causative organism? Usually, what's the most common in hip hemophilias, right? Yeah, if a patient had pneumonia, then Streptococcus pneumonia would be the most likely causative organism. However, the chest x ray shows no evidence of consolidation, making diagnosis of pneumonia unlikely. Hemophilus influenza is the most common cause of infective exacerbation of COPD. The patient should be treated with a cause of oxycycline or a tetracycline together with prednisolone. Next question. A 39-year-old woman presents to the emergency department for our history of left-sided leg weakness. Left-sided leg weakness. All sensory modalities are intact and there is no weakness of the face or arms. That sounds like a stroke on the right side of the brain, but only affecting the lower motor neurons. So, I mean, lower, lower limb. So she has no visual symptoms and there's no higher cortical deficit evident. Oh, this is a... How do you differentiate? Huh? What are the categories of stroke? There's tacky, packy, lax. Total anterior circulation infarct, uh, partial anterior circulation infarct, uh, lacuna stroke, posterior circulation infarct. Right? She has no visual symptoms and there is no higher cortical deficit evidence. Her past medical history is significant for repression for which she takes fluoxetine. She drinks a glass of wine every night but does not smoke or use recreational drugs. On examination, there is 1 out of 5 power in left leg, 5 out of 5 power in left arm, right leg, and on the right side, the weakness uh, is hypotonic. Hoover's sign is positive in the left leg. What's Hoover's sign again? I want to differentiate between pseudo and something stroke, right? Press down. It has to lift the other leg and then you can feel it pressing down your finger. Hoover sign positive. I think this is a trick question. So it's functional. Yeah. 
Uversign is a quick and useful clinical tool to differentiate organic from non-organic leg paralysis. In organic paralysis, the contralateral leg will contract due to the involuntary hip extension when an attempt is made to lift the paralyzed leg. In non-organic, for example, conversion disorder or contralateral contraction is no contralateral contraction is felt. The isolation of the weakness to the leg as well as positive Hoover's signs suggest that the most likely cause of the weakness is the functional neurological disorder, also called conversion disorder. This is the presence of persistent neurological symptoms in the absence of detectable structural damage. The patient has risk factors. It's a female sex, young, middle age, psychiatric history. Myasthenia gravis would be more likely to present with generalized weakness that worsens over the course of the day. It would be unusual to be entirely localized to one limb and not affect other areas of the body. Multiple sclerosis is a good differential for this patient due to the unusual distribution of symptoms. However, the weakness in MS is typically hypertonic and would not give a positive Hoover sign. And the deficit is organic in nature. The absence of visual symptoms suggestive of optic neuritis also lowers the probability of MS. MS. Hypertonic, uh, because it's upper motor neuron. Okay, stroke is key differential to exclude the patient with new onset focal neurology. It would be unusual for a stroke to affect a 39 year old non smoker, especially only affecting a single limb. Over sign would be negative in a stroke as the weakness is organic in nature. Over sign will be negative in stroke as the weakness is organic in nature. A motor neuron disease typically presents more insidiously and has a mixture of low and upper motor neuron signs, including fasciculations and wasting. Fasciculation is what sign? Is it lower motor neuron or upper motor neuron sign? Huh? Wasting is a lower motor neuron sign. You know, upper also can uh, disuse atrophy. It is an organic disease, and so Hoover sign would not be expected to be would would be expected to be negative. Mm. What's fasciculation? Is it upper motor? No. Lower motor neuron syndrome is characterized by following symptoms. Although both upper and motor lower and uh, upper and both upper and motor neuron lesions uh, result in muscle weakness, they are clinically distinct due to various other manifestations. Unlike upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons lesions present with muscular muscle atrophy, fasciculations. So lower motor neuron fasciculations, muscle twitching, decreased reflexes, decreased tone. So fasciculation is a lower motor neuron sign. Hmm, how do I try to remember this? Wasting. Muscle on its own. Muscle move on its own when the slower motor neuron is gone. Okay. Guess. You see, uh, in upper motor neuron lesion, you have hyperreflex because there's no more inhibitory uh, signal from the upper motor neurons. So you have hyperreflex straight away from um, afferent neuron to interneuron to efferent neuron, the reflex pathway. It's not inhibited by upper motor neuron anymore. anymore. So in uh, muscle fasciculations, you can think of it in a similar way in that there is no more inhibition from the lower motor neuron. So the muscle just um, activates on its own. And that's when you see fasciculations. Okay. And I guess... Um, that's 10 questions. It's about one hour. I'll see you in the next one.